Do you want to have a better understanding of how to manage patient data in healthcare? If so, then listen to this episode of the EGP Learning Podblast, where I speak to Muhammad al Obedli, who's the CEO of Patients Know Best, aka PKB, as we talk about this aspect, as well as various other things regarding health technology and his own journey to create a company that allows the sharing of patient records quickly, effectively, and safely. As always, you can hear content like this and more on the EGP Learning Podblast, and make sure you subscribe for more content. Shall we begin? Hi, GP learners. So today I'm joined by Dr. Mohammed Al Obedli from PKB, uh, also known as Patients Knows Best. Are you there, Mohammed? I am, yes. Good. Yeah, um, so we just come off the Maybank holiday weekend, some glorious weather, and I hope it'll stay yes. that way. Um, so thank you for joining me. Um, I guess rather than me introducing you to our listeners, it's better if you introduce yourself because you've had a really interesting journey. So tell us a little bit about how you've got to where you are. Sure. Uh, so I trained as a physician and programmer. So I went through medical school writing software, um, which was really interesting because the, when the professors hear that you can program, they ask you to write software for them. And for me to write, the professor of radiology and the professor of cardiology have to teach me what they know. So mm-hmm. I got a very interesting education at medical school. Uh, did a one-year GP house job uh, and then did some research in the States, during which time I wrote six books about using IT in healthcare. Okay. One of them was how do you share medical records with a patient? Uh, so if you're an IT director of a hospital, how do you make your medical records available to your patients? And I got really obsessed, frankly, with that problem because uh, I have a rare disease. So when I see my doctor, he panics, doesn't know what to do. Um, and I tell him what my different specialists have told me. Mm-hmm. And I give him advice on what they reckon I should be doing. And I realized as I was writing the book and seeing what all the different doctors and patients had done uh, was that my doctor trusts me not because I'd gone to medical school but because I'd gone to all the appointments mm-hmm. I am a de facto integrator of um, my healthcare delivery um, and so I thought well if I got that information as a patient I could help my doctor as he helps me um, and so I spent a year trying to convince US hospitals to do that mm-hmm. uh, and they for, for a whole bunch of reasons they didn't do that anywhere near the scale and the speed that I wanted. And so I thought if I want this done, I've I've literally written the book about it. Um, Mm -hmm. And I really want it as a patient myself. So I'm going to start a company that makes this happen at scale and at pace. Um, And actually one of the mistakes I spotted from people is that they were doing, they were thinking it's a technology problem. So it has to be started in the USA. Uh, Whereas actually I thought it was a a trust problem. And so it has to start in the NHS in the UK. Mm -hmm. And so I came back to the UK in 2008 uh, we went into the N3 network in 2009 and we started in Great Ormond Street Hospital in 2010. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've just been focused on that uh, since then. And uh, I mean, working with Great Ormond Street, how was that kind of experience? Because obviously the very um, notable hospital and, and their specialist work, I guess, is obviously, I guess, a key way that's helped with the, the development of the product. But, but what was that experience like? Uh, I mean, it's amazing. Uh, the, so the, the people who agreed to work with us in the beginning, it's a new innovation, it's a new company. Um, it's, it's always, they're always at the cutting edge of doing something brilliant for patients. And so it, it's quite humbling being with them and seeing what that does for families that mm-hmm. they're helping out. Um, if I'm honest, if I, if I knew then what I know now, um, I wouldn't have started at Great Ormond Street. It's immensely complicated the work they do. Yep. Um, but the flip side is having gotten through that with them, you know, all the information governance, all the security, all the technology, all the integration. Mm-hmm. Um, having gotten through that extreme environment, um, it meant that we could roll out in lots of other places. It, the, the system's been very thoroughly st- uh, tested. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the beginning, it was just one doctor. You know, a couple of clinicians said to me, you should go talk to Susan. Mm-hmm. You'll like what you're doing. Um, and basically, as soon as I sat down with her, it was obvious. Apparently, she'd been wanting this for over five years. She okay. was looking at 35 children with intestinal failure. Mm-hmm. And each of those children was the only one in that town with that condition. Mm-hmm. And so when the child goes to A&E, um, they don't know what to do. Uh, mum knows what to do, but mum doesn't get listened to. And yeah. they fax back and forth to Great Ormond Street. And that delays the treatment time for the child. And so Susan, I mean, she said to me, I, I worry about this children. You could tell she genuinely 
she thought about it a lot. She worried about their safety. So she just wanted a way to send the information with the family and for that to go wherever the child goes um, and to make her team available as quickly and as auditably as possible uh, for the super specialist care for those children. Um, and so we just kept on doing things based on what she and her family needed. Um, and you could just see the changes that led to for the care and the safety of those children. And then we just went from there to lots of other specialties and lots of other regions. Uh, but th those first doctors and those patients that we work with, um, it, it's a lovely experience. You talked about how you started with, obviously with those super specialist areas and things. And, and now, I mean, uh, patient knows best. So PKB um, is effectively this um, system, this, you know, method of sharing records for patients, by patients kind of thing. Can you explain to us where you are now with, uh, and what exactly is PKB? Because I guess a, a lot of our listeners may not have heard of it. Of course. So from a patient's perspective, you get invited into a website, you register, and when you log in, there's all your medical records from the different institutions looking after you. When we started off, it, you might only see some of the data from some of your doctors, the ones who invited you. Now we have region-wide contracts like Northwest London, where when you log in, you'll see all your hospital and all your GP data mm -hmm. uh, from Northwest London, but also uh, from any of 30 other hospitals outside the, the patch who are also sending us data. And then that website, um, it will update you real time on any new data that arrives from anyone looking after you. And you can give anyone access to it that you want. Uh, so if you go traveling, you can give access to someone in a &E about it. If you want your local physiotherapist to have access, you just, give, you just invite them free of charge. Okay. From a professional's perspective, um, it's a, uh, either a website that you log into or a window that's part of your existing medical record in EMIS, for example, uh, that when you click into it, you can see all the information from other providers about the patient as well as anything that you've entered. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a way of interacting with the patient should you choose to do so. So you can run online consultations. You can do truly shared care planning. So not a care plan that's in your GP system that nobody else can see or change, but genuinely a shared care plan where you and all the other providers can edit it together as well as the patient can see and edit it with you. And everyone's feeding information about the care of that patient. Okay. And it's a way of automating care for the patient. So it will automatically safely tell the patient the test result. So they don't have to come in and see you in clinic about it. It will automatically uh, give the patient a discharge letter so uh, they know what's happened. They can bring it to, from the hospital to the GP if they want it. Um, and it will prompt the patient to enter data that you find useful whether it's a uh, daily symptom tracking automated <laughs> measurements from devices uh, or messages uh, that they uh, consultations that they can deal with you so if i can uh, feedback my understanding of what you described to me um so it's kind of like you've got a bucket um and everybody's got their kind of part that they stick into the bucket when it comes to patient information and effectively what pkb allows is that that bucket is then owned by the patient and then they then share that with whoever they want to, rather than what many of my colleagues and what clinicians will probably understand, which is normally they own the buckets, the data uh, controllers, uh, which is obviously the GP notes and stuff. Is that a good analogy, would you say? It, it's a, a good analogy of, of what happens on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, just a few caveats in, in case some people panic about bucket ownership. Okay. Um, and it's a really good bucket, I, I want to emphasize to the listeners. Um, so the the data controller still is data controller for anything that went from their system into PKB. Okay. So the hospital's test results, the GP's diagnoses and so on. Mm -hmm. However, the contract that we sign with them, there's the, the copy of the data we get from them as data controller. Mm -hmm. At the time they give us the copy, that copy, they assign ownership to the patient. Okay. Which then eases questions around data sharing and so on because the patient can then authorize anyone um, whether it's a private or a public provider, whether it's a family member uh, or a registered professional, mm -hmm. um, the fact they've transferred the ownership of that copy um, solves a lot of the IG issues. Mm -hmm. um, and the second thing to say is that um, the patient gets the power of control, mm -hmm. but not the burden of control. Okay. So the patient can manually add whoever they want and everyone they want, mm -hmm. but they don't need to do it for the patient to be looked after. 
So if you are looking after the patient and you just log in and say, okay, I am directly looking after this patient. He's been referred to me or has turned up an A&E. Mm -hmm. You just click through and then you can see the full record. You don't need explicit consent from the patient. You just document the implicit consent. Okay. And if it's an emergency with um, the patient not being able to provide not having the capacity, they're unconscious, for example. Okay. You can break the glass and get full access, and it's logged as a break the glass event. And mm -hmm. then they do wake up. You can uh, go back and document anything else that you want as implicit or explicit. Um, so it really is about looking after the patient and documenting how you've done so rather than um, adding steps for you to look after the patient. It's supposed to just facilitate all the information following the patient for the people looking after their patient. Mm -hmm. um, in the fastest, most efficient way. So that's a really good way of explaining how PKB works. I guess one of the things you mentioned was that the patient can elect what they share and, and how they kind of share it. Um, one of the questions I had then was, what if a patient doesn't share information? So for example, there is a growing use of patients seeing, for example, private clinicians or yes. um, specialist areas and stuff. And, and actually GPs may not often be aware of that because those systems don't necessarily feed into GP notes. So yes. how does that work with PKB, but also in particularly, you know, the, the liability um, aspect of knowing that information? Um, so uh, just to immediately answer your question, um, mm. PKB shows you what you're seeing and tells you what can't be seen. So the, the record is broken down to general, sexual, mental and social care data. Mm -hmm. um, and so the patient may decide you're only going to see general and not sexual and mental and social care mm -hmm. and the PKB can't tell you it, it won't tell you that there is some sexual information that's hidden but it will mm -hmm. tell you that you're not allowed to see the sexual health information okay so at that point uh, first of all you're it's and it's legally noted that when you made your decision the patient hadn't shared the sexual health information with you so if you made a decision that was incorrect in the absence of that information well it was correct given that the patient did not give you access to the information Okay. But you can also then say to the patient, look, um, I see you've not let me see the sexual and mental health information. Actually, um, it would help me for the safety of looking after you if I can see that. Because um, if you don't tell it to me, I'll make the wrong decision. And uh, at that point, the patient may give you access. And then um, when they're not happy with somebody else, they may take away access. Mm -hmm. um, but it drives a very transparent conversation. And you are protected about the decisions being made with the information that you've got access to. Having said that, um, first of all, the, I mean, if you look at Great Ormond Street, they found that the transparency was very useful for them because as the family went around and opened up the record and had consultations with different parties, the Great Ormond Street could always see that at any time, and it's locked. Um, as they go to different private providers, um, if they've done, if they've elected to share information PKB, you can see that. So it increases the transparency and the safety. Mm -hmm. um, and then just, you know, where, where I started my research in the States on this, um, I saw a number of systems that had been built by the providers, which really allowed the granular consent around share this part, but not that part. And there was one team in Washington, actually, who'd done, he'd gone the furthest in this. Uh, and what they said is they regretted making it so granular because basically the patients, um, very few of them had any interest in blocking information from the clinicians. Mm -hmm. So all the, you know, don't hide this, don't share this test result. And don't, that was completely not used for the patients. Mm -hmm. um, the, in fact, the only thing they did use it for is they wanted to make sure that having shared this bit of data with the doctor, the doctor did actually look at it. So the patients weren't worried about hiding the record. They were worried about, is the doctor seeing the record when I'm mm -hmm. having a consultation with them? Um, and that's really the attitude of most patients. They, they want their professionals to see everything. Uh, it's good for the patient as well as being good for the profession. And I guess um, with that, um, one of the key areas that I always get concerned about, particularly the area that I work in, is stuff like safeguarding information and things, you know, yes. third party, that kind of stuff. How, how does that work with PKB? Is there particular systems or is it about what the organization shares into PKB or is there other mechanisms with that? Correct. So every organization and team decides what they're sharing and mm -hmm. you know, the, the normal sequence they go through is um, here's the test results um, and we do some configuration for clinical safety about certain ones having delays. Uh, here's the letters, you know, all this stuff is, non-controversial and automated and delivers immediate value um, and then let's do the clinical transformation for shared care planning 
Um, and then let's get to the very end to showing the full narrative of the consultations and managing the safeguarding information and so on. And there may be some patients, uh, obviously a minority, but um, they're important minority where you decide for any of a number of reasons uh, on safeguarding, you mm. don't share with that patient or you don't share some information with that patient. Say so maybe there's a woman uh, that's at risk of violence at home if the spouse got access to the record, for example. Mm. So you may decide not to give access that kind of thing and um, but those are nuances towards the end and at every stage the organization deciding what data they have about the person that they release to the person mm -hmm. um, and so we go through that clinical process with them from you know the easy valuable stuff immediately to the complicated nuanced stuff at the end how did you come up with the name of pkb out of interest <laughs> so um i mean I, the, the idea behind it is uh, this is our mission statement. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're not saying that patients do know best, um, although many of them do. Um, we're just saying that our mission is that patients do know best. Um, so if you give them the information, if you give them the explanations, and if you make available to them the circle of care, the professionals who guide them through the decisions, at that point, the patients will know best. Um, and, and that's really what we're about. Um, now, I will say that it started off from me just thinking back to my own appointments um, when I know more about my health than my doctor does, um, not because I've gone to medical school, but because I'm the one who's been living with a condition that's one in a million. And my GP has 10,000 other patients, none of whom have this condition. Um, so from that perspective, I already do know best. Um, now, I need help. I need support from all the people who give me the medications, do the treatments and so on. Um, but of all the people who know about me, I'm the one who knows the most. And you found that a lot with rare disease conditions. Mm -hmm. um, the flip side is um, people who don't know what's going on, um, we want them to know what's going on. It's uh, as we talk about the ability to continue to fund the NHS and to continue to make that promise for a population that everybody is covered, regardless of the ability to pay but we struggle with the increasing costs and the decreasing uh, workforce uh, in healthcare. Mm -hmm. The only way we can continue to provide cover is if some of the patients at least have the ability to see everything, understand everything and do more. Mm -hmm. uh, so it starts from the diabetic who's injecting themselves with a dangerous medication called insulin that we trust them. If we give them more information, they can self-assess and self-manage more. And that structurally changes the cost of delivery in healthcare, which allows us to sustain the NHS as well as improving the quality of care for everyone. And you talked about patients being able to sort of share in with PKB. And in that part, you talked about um, adding data from devices and that kind of stuff. So yes. talking about things like wearables, I guess, things like the Fitbit, the Apple Watch. And, and how, how can clinicians use that to, I guess, improve the patient experience of their healthcare? So I'll give you two simple examples. So if you've got a diabetic patient mm -hmm. and you want to assess um, you know, their glucose measurements uh, and their exercise and their diet, and you do the paper diary, which I always call the car park diary, you know, the patient feels guilty in the car park for coming to your point, they haven't filled out and they fill mm -hmm. it out there, right? It's, it's laborious, they don't yeah. do it. Um, but the data exists now in devices that cost £100 each. Mm -hmm. And so if you just start using them, they stream in real time. Um, it's complete it's accurate and if you want to see them before the appointment you can um so that changes the quality of the conversation during the appointment because oh i see that your sugar is not well controlled or you haven't taken the exit or whatever it is you can have a much better conversation based on data for then allowing the change management with the patient um second example is uh, oxford they have built a ketamine registry for treatment resistant patients Okay. Uh, with depression uh, so uh, ketamine uh, from what i understand is a very it, it's extremely effective drug in that cohort um but it can be dangerous because it's quite addictive and it's a very sudden effect right people who for years not been able to treat their depression suddenly change within a couple of appointments mm -hmm. um uh, to the point I've, I've said it's even addictive for the prescriber to see that change in that transformation in your patients so the oxford team wanted to build uh, an international registry for the safe monitoring of what's happening to these patients. Um, and so using PKB, they can get data 
from the patients. Um, mm-hmm. So the Fitbit, for example, tracks your sleep cycles. Mm-hmm. Um, is this patient getting more or less insomnia? Now, you couldn't do that with EMIS. You couldn't do that with Cerner mm-hmm. for the medical rep. But if it's a, a patient-centered system like PKB, we'll store all this information. And then you can bring in all kinds of other parties. So they started in Oxford and the NHS, but now they're adding um, private providers in London because ketamine gets a lot of private prescriptions. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you can now start monitoring this on a registry level, bringing in data from all the people looking after the patient, that's definitely an improvement in safety and, and efficacy. The issue is that nobody's trained you in medical school on well, what do you do with it? What do you do with the yep. sleep patterns and the walking um, and the glucose information? So the next stage will definitely require um, systems that automate the alerting for the patients. And we're working with a number of providers around how to put this in. Um, but the other part is, um, you know, some of what you're doing, it's uh, that medical school never taught the doctor how to live in that world where they're mm-hmm. now data rich. Um, what's the safe way to do it? What's the efficient way of doing it? Um, Cause you definitely have to do it. Um, and it's definitely an opportunity, but that there's a whole aspect of training that hasn't come through in medical schools. You mentioned EMIS. Um, so focusing a little bit more on the UK side of things, which particular systems work with PKB and, and is there challenges with some of them? So we've done a direct integration, <clears throat> excuse me, we've done direct integration with EMIS uh, so that um, if you click a button inside EMIS as a practice manager um, to authorize it, then the following day, all data comes in and continues to come into PKB. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you register as a professional, as GP, um, they become single sign-on. So once you're logged into EMIS, there's a button you click and you see the PKB data without okay. entering any more username and password. So that's the kind of thing um, we can do with a system that's uh, open and collaborative um, within the GP environment. Um, so TPP um, and X for us. So the way that we've done it is not using their existing infrastructure. Um, we just took their extract and working with our customers, we processed that into PKB. Mm-hmm. Um, on a local GP by GP basis. Um, but that's the other end of the spectrum where uh, TPP have been less cooperative. As, so I think EMIS have seen it as their business model is if you open up the APIs, then there's a revenue opportunity. So we pay them for that. We're happy. Yeah. It's good value for money. Uh, TPP traditionally have gone for the approaches of if they lock down the data, then more people will buy TPP. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, these are business decisions. They're certainly not clinical decisions or safety decisions mm-hmm. um, i would say the world is changing to um the people who work with other parties will win and the ones who go for the lock-in model will lose um, but that's down to um i mean in the, in the long term i think that's where it's going to happen in the short term mm-hmm. it's going to be down to the individual buyers and central buyers um making that uh that desire clear in the contracts they pay for okay I mean, a lot of our listeners will know I often compare um, EMIS and TPP to Android and Apple. So um, I think of EMIS kind of like your Android system that shares with a lot of people, but has its base system and TPP as um, the kind of Apple of healthcare um, records kind of thing, which, although I love it, I also hate it at times because like you said, (laughs) dropability is a challenge um, and limits some of the things that you can do with it, unfortunately. Yeah. What I would say is... um... Apple can just about get away with it. Yeah. Um, if if you're going to do it, you have to, you're going to have to be as good as Apple. Yeah. It helps being one of the most profitable companies in the world, doesn't it? I, uh, <laughs> the first billion is the hardest, I say. Yeah. Um, so if we're talking about money, um, I guess one of my questions I had um, with the new long-term plan and, and particularly the new GP contract, the new unit of care, I guess, um, from a commissioning and, and provider aspect is um, primary care networks. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know some of my listeners will be interested to know exactly how much would PKB cost for a primary care network? So we're talking typically the, the 30 to 50 K patients group kind of thing. Sure. Um, so we tend to, I, I'll just, there's four different ways that we get paid. Okay. Uh, so at one level is just a, a department. So it might be the diabetes team in the hospital or the ASTA team in um, the GP surgery. Um, at the other end, it's covering a full population. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I want all 2.3 million people in London. Mm-hmm. Um, and in between, 
you might get cover a whole hospital uh, or cover a whole line of care. So I want all cancer patients uh, in Sussex, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so primary care networks, um, uh, uh, it's possible to have contracts for covering a population of 30 to 50,000 people. Um, but we find it's better if you just do it at CCG or STP level. Mm -hmm. Um, where basically, particularly because if you look at the funding um, of the NHS, uh, you know, of every £100 spent, about 49 goes into a hospital and seven goes into a GP, um, yeah. which, you know, everybody has views that it's wrong, but, but those, that's where the numbers go. Um, so actually, I don't think the GPs should be shouldering um, anything like the majority of that funding. I think mm -hmm. it sits with the, with the health economy. Um, and then the GPs get access as part of that. And so we really go on population funding. Um, and so just ballpark figures, um, if you're covering a whole population at scale, um, you're looking about £1.50 a person a year um, for the lives that you cover. And that covers everything, right? So all of health and social care, the GPs, mm -hmm. the hospitals, mental health, and so on. And, and it's the full record, um, including data from the patient, including all the devices they have. And that record that you may cover for the STP will receive data from all our other contracts um, who are also looking after the same NHS number. Okay. So that's the kind of ballpark figure that we're talking about. And out of interest, do you have any information, I guess, on the, and I can't think of a better way of asking this, so it's a very financial thing, but the return on investment as a result of that for the healthcare system, because we always talk about how um, you spend a certain amount of money to save money. That That's pretty much the, the aim of the NHS at this moment in time. You're trying to, you know have that return on investment have you got any information to to give us that idea what sharing the patient notes with the patient by the patient can actually have that impact yes um so I, i'm going to give you um two ends of the spectrum for that um so uh, the one in the spectrum is the you know it's, it's obvious this saves money right so if you look at surrey east surrey hospital with four thousand patients with ibd you know, one in every 150 people has Crohn's or colitis. Uh, they put 4,000 patients on PKB and the HSN said they save four million pounds a year. And that's in um, avoiding face-to-face -face appointments, mm -hmm. um, being able to switch the patients onto cheaper, safer medications because you can remotely monitor the safety profile mm -hmm. uh, and on avoiding surgery. That becomes four million pounds a year for 4,000 patients. Okay. Um, and you can do that for every disease line, right? Um, you do have to clinically transform the service. You do have to make decisions about when you're going to see which patients and so on. Um, but you can do this in every disease area. Now, when you go to a CFO of a, a hospital or a health economy, they say, okay, that makes sense, but I don't believe my doctors. Um, you know, they say they're going to do something, but um, they save money one way and then they find another way to do more care for more patients um so i need something to release his cash so the other end of the spectrum that we say is actually if you uh, mass register a hundred thousand patients um so you send out letters to their home and they um uh through the, the 30 days to complete registration um twenty five thousand patients register within 30 days and those twenty five thousand patients uh, we've automated in the system that uh, the, what you would have posted to them from the hospital, um, they've got 48 hours to look at the data within PKB. Mm -hmm. If they do, then you don't have to post it anymore. So at that point, you've avoided spending a pound on postage yep. and you pay PKB 28 pence for the pound that you've saved. Mm -hmm. So the CFO looks at that and says, okay, that makes sense because if, I, uh, if the patient doesn't look at the data, then I still have to post... I still have to spend a pound, but PKB gets nothing. Mm -hmm. um, if they take three days to look at it, so I still have to post, um, PKB didn't do it well enough, PKB doesn't get paid. But if they do look at it within 48 hours, um, I get to save a pound and I'll give some of that cash to PKB. Uh, and so what we're seeing in the data right now is about 70% of patients look at it within 48 hours. Okay. And that cash release actually pays for the whole of PKB. Mm -hmm. So the real money... Um, isn't in avoiding a pound for the postage about the appointment. It's the hundred pounds for the appointment itself being prevented or avoiding their thousand pound A&E visit. 
uh, that's the real clinical transformation. That's what, what happens when the patient knows best. Mm-hmm. But for in terms of cash releasing, just the fact the patients are looking at data digitally saves you on postage and that covers the full cost. And then, you bought, and then you've got yourself 25% of your patients already registered and engaging mm-hmm. and you can do the clinical transformation. Wow. And that definitely fits in, obviously, with Matt Hancock's vision for changing the way that people use the healthcare system. And particularly, he obviously, um, I think about two months ago, talked about um, emailing patients rather than posting them because of the safety aspects and the potential cost savings and all the other simple things that can happen as a result of using digital rather than postal. Cool. Um, So what do you see as the future for PKB? Uh, It's really going out as many populations as quickly as possible. Uh, so in uh, 2015 was our first population contract in Northwest London. Um, but it was actually the first in time in the world that a population had decided to put the control over the data sharing in the hands of the patients. Um, 2017, we did a national integration with the Welsh government. Uh, so a patient completes registration within two minutes. Um, they get all their past test results for the previous 10 years in their record. Uh, and so what we're looking, uh, what we doing right now is working with um, local health economies, STPs, and national governments uh, like Wales to facilitate uh, a rollout at scale. Mm -hmm. Um, And we want to do this not just in the UK, which is four nations, uh, but in every country. So we already have a Dutch data center we've had for for the EU. Um, We've got contracts in the Netherlands, Germany, and other countries. Um, so the system is really built out for any modern medical system to use. And we want to put this in as many countries for as many populations as possible. But the NHS is the one that pioneered that approach mm-hmm. of being uh, patient centered and working at massive scale around the health economy. And okay. so that's why we've been able to demonstrate that the soonest and the greatest. Okay. And if any of our listeners wanted to find out more about PKB or even, you know, look at, using that system for their patients and um, how would you advise them to go about doing that so www.patientsknowbest.com um, has examples of what the system looks like uh, case studies is the best way to get started on the website um, but i would just click the contact us button um, we love to hear from different people so drop us a line we'd love to show it to you in your own surgery or hospital okay it's been Really good talking to you, Mohammed. Um, I have three questions I ask everybody whenever I speak to them. Um, so number one, what is your favorite n- kind of work-based app that you tend to use? So the one I'm using the most is, uh, you know, Gmail and Slack um, mm-hmm. for email and instant messaging. Um, but the one I truly love um, is uh, Stitcher. So it's a podcast app okay. um, that has a lot of really good work-relevant podcasts. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I live by that every day. Wow. And, and for our listeners, yes, EGP Learning Podblast is on Stitcher as well. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, and what is your favorite non-work app? So this one I found recently. Um, I, I've been a Kindle fan from day one for mm-hmm. reading books. Um, but I found Scribd, uh, S-C-R-I-B-D dot com. Um, basically, Scribd is Netflix for books, right? Okay. It's, and it's a huge selection of books i've I've found some really weird obscure ones um so i'm a book lover so this is it's tremendous it's also got a whole bunch of audio books all free you pay 10 quid a month and you get everything Mm -hmm. um and just a special shout out just started reading a book about the original siamese twins as in the conjoined twins from siam thailand okay uh, and their life um i didn't realize that that those twins got married to two American women, two sisters, and they had 19 children. And they made so much money from being shown around as freaks of nature. They owned 65 slaves in African America, African Americans in the USA. So wow. it's, it's extraordinary stories you get um, on script. I, I love that. that app. Wow. wow. That definitely sounds interesting. Okay. Um, and my final question, I, I love asking everyone. So tomorrow morning, you've got a meeting with um, Matt Hancock um, and he says to you, Mohammed, um, I want you to try and change things. I'm giving you a hundred million pounds. I'm going to clear all the red tape for you, but possibly there. The only thing I'm going to say to you is you have to spend this on health technology. How, how would you spend it? Uh, so, I mean, you can tell what I'm obsessed with. I, I think that you can't do any of the innovation. Um, all the 
digital technologies that are coming mm-hmm. would be made better if the, pa- the, data, <coughs> the data was in the hands of the patients. Mm-hmm. So release all the data at scale to everybody um, and then all the innovators doing artificial intelligence, home monitoring devices and so on have a layer of innovation to, to build on top of. Do you think 100 million would do that? Uh, I, I know 100 million would do that. In, in fact, um, so if, if you want to do at scale, so if you wanted PKB for the whole country, £1.50 a person is 100 million pounds. Okay, wow. That's a great marketing strategy. <laughs> Um, so it's been really great speaking to you, Mohammed. I've I, I really enjoyed it. I, I think I've learned a lot about particularly how patient knows best works uh, and also the use of technology in terms of improving patient care, patient data. And that whole concept of, of ownership of data is clearly a hot topic at the moment. Interoperability of data is a big thing right now, obviously, with some of the challenges that we're facing. But if those challenges are overcome, I think we will see, like you mentioned, improved healthcare for the population, which is the key focus right now i guess because that's what we need to do um i guess was there any last kind of things you wanted to say to our listeners before we finished off uh just thanks so much for the opportunity i, I really enjoyed the podcast thanks for saying thank you very much great speaking to you and i hope to hear back from you soon take care thank you bye we hope you enjoyed that interview episode of the egp learning pod blast with muhammad al Lee of patients know best pkb if you've got any comments or suggestions, feel free to contact us either at drgandalf 52 or at EGP Learning. And please consider leaving us a review either on iTunes or Google Podcasts or on the YouTube platform. Your feedback is what continues to drive us to make more of this content for you. And as always, we are here to help save yours and your patients' time by tech enhancing your primary care and learning. See you later.